in most situations now, the gyroscope is integrated in the same chip as the accelerometer. So, the, the, and just in order to save uh, space and also, and also money, the two things are, are integrated. Now, let me just show you how a gyroscope works. No. Gyroscope in Italian is giroscopio. Giroscopio measure, measures the orientation in space. In general, in three dimensions. If you want to measure the orientation in space of an object in three dimensions, you need typically three angles. You need this angle, you need this angle, and you need this angle. Okay? So, uh, uh, which are basically the orientation along the three axes. Okay? And uh, again, just to understand the principle of operation, we will consider the uh, orientation along just one angle at a time, but uh, in, in practice, uh, in the case of the gyroscope, you have three, in the most general case, you have three different gyroscopes, one for each, orient, each uh, uh, axis of orientation. Okay. Now, what's the use, for, um, what's the use of, of uh, uh, gyroscopes? Well, the, the main use is navigation. Navigation when you cannot use a compass. Compass è la bussola. And, uh, and uh, for example, when the geomagnetic field cannot be used. Of course, uh, the compass can give you the direction of the north, uh, and then you can have, uh, you can use it for orientation. This is the most common thing okay, during, during navigation on, on, on the sea. But there are many applications in which actually you cannot measure the magnetic field of the Earth. For example, you typically cannot measure the magnetic field of the Earth in space. It does not give you any information, but also on a plane. Okay. So in those cases, in order to understand the orientation of the plane, you need a gyroscope. And in practice, the first important use of gyroscopes has been on planes. So, very expensive situation, but a another situation in which you need, uh, you cannot use the, the geomagnetic field is in, is in a tunnel. Because in a, in a tunnel, typically, the uh, geomagnetic field is distorted. In the case, of course, there is some metal in the mountain through which the tunnel passes, and therefore, it's not usable. And in this case, you need to use a, 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 a gyroscope. Uh, for example, also now, uh, for car navigation, uh, typically one uses the GPS. But uh, in, in some models, when the GPS cannot be accessed, such as, for example, in tunnels, then uh, the, 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 there's a gyroscope which, uh, which uh, let's say, helps in the navigation. Typically, both the gyroscopes and uh, the odometer, the, not the, 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 the velocity sensor, uh, allow to, let's say, continue the navigation also when the GPS signal cannot be detected anymore. So, space, planes, 
tunnels. Okay. Uh, the first gyroscopes on planes were really large objects, mechanic, me mechanical ones, but this size, let's say. Uh, of course, now the most common situation is uh, the use of uh, uh, MEMS gyroscopes. So, gyroscopes. Uh, Uh, fabricated with MEMS technology. The other very common uses are the ones in robotics. In order, for example, to know the position of a robotic arm, if you want to have a, a feedback system, you, you, you need to, let's say, you have a, a motor in order to Control to drive the position of the arm, and then you can use uh, a, a gyroscope in order to measure the position of the arm, the orientation of the arm in space, okay, independently, so that you have a feedback signal that allows you to make a control loop of the of the of the arm. Uh, you also need. Uh, in many mass market application gyroscopes for stabilization for example to have to make a, um, a camera a photo camera with a, a, an automatic stabilizer then you typically have a gyroscope if you want to understand the let's say the position of the camera and, and and to correct let's say the the, the movement of the camera you need a gyroscope you need a gyroscope also to stabilize drones because you need to detect the position of the drones at any moment in order to correct. Just it is the same situation as in, as in robotics. You need to know the position of the drones in order to correct uh, the, the, the control of the motors. Okay. As I mentioned, they are typically uh, sold on a, this is called system on package. With 3D accelerometers. They call it the six axis. accelerometer when they say six axis accelerometer gyroscope means a package in which you have a 3d gyroscope plus a 3d accelerometer now from a physical point of view the uh, principle of operation is based on the uh, conservation of angular momentum. You, you know of the conservation of angular momentum for the first course in physics. But let me just re recall the concept and, uh, and so that we can see how this can be applied. So the, the total angular momentum of a system is constant if no external forces is acting on the system. So let's see, if no external force force acts on a system, the total angular momentum of the system 
uh, uh, the angular momentum of a system is defined uh, with respect to a point. Let's say with respect with respect to a given point, any point is cons is conserved. So this is the, the principle that is exploited and this has always been the mechanism that has been exploited okay, uh, historically. The point is that you need to start with a system that has some angular momentum and then you need to, uh, to use the fact that the angular momentum is preserved. So, for example, if you want to have a system that has some angular momentum, you can put a mass in rotation. Okay? So you have a ball that rotates along the axis, and then you have a system that has some angular momentum. Uh, and, and, and indeed, the first gyroscopes were based on a rotating mass. If you want to simplify things, then you can put a mass in vibration, which is what we do in the case of MEMS gyroscopes. So a mass, a, a mass which is again attached to the plate of a capacitance is put in vibration. When it is put in vibration, it has some angular momentum, and then we're using the conservation of this angular momentum. Of course, it's easier if you want to do something on a solid state to have a vibrating body you can have a vibrating membrane. It's much easier than to have a rotating thing. We use a vibrating mass. In our case, it's a vibrating membrane. Okay. And... Uh, uh, Indeed, in practice, the way we, uh, we exploit the conservation of angular momentum is by exploiting the uh, Coriolis force. So, let me, let me stress a bit what is the Coriolis force. It is a, it, it is an inertial force inertial force in Italian will be called forza apparente it's like uh, um, the centrifugal force is uh, in, in, also the centrifugal force is an inertial force una forza apparente okay? which emerges as you can see in a reference system rotating with respect to a fixed reference system. Uh, again, like the centrifugal force, you see it in a reference system that rotates with respect to a fixed reference system. So, uh, I don't want to uh, make uh, all the computation in order to derive the Coriolis force. I just want to give you uh, an intuitive picture of the Coriolis force so that you can intuitively understand. You probably have already seen it in detail in, in uh, physics class, but but sometimes these things get gets lost. So I, I, I'm going to uh, stress again the concept. 
uh, without using formulas, then I will tell you the formula. But uh, at this, in this, uh, let's say, situation, it's not really important to, to be able to derive the formula. But uh, le let me show you this example. Let's assume that we have uh, a box here. This is the case that is rotating in this direction with uh, um, velocity, angular velocity omega. This is the angular velocity. of the system around this point, okay? Uh, this is it. And so this is rotating, and in this system we have a mass here, which is not, uh, uh, on, on which there, are, there is no force. So this uh, mass is moving, for example, in this direction with constant velocity. There is no mass acting on this force. So, let us make a, 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 a let's say, a small animation. Let's assume, you, you understand what happens here. The, the box rotates, and at the same time, the mass is going up. The, 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 the point is going up. So, what I'm doing is the following here. I'm drawing three snapshots of this situation along this, uh, this axis. So let's assume this is time zero. Then at some time larger than zero, for example, the box has rotated in, uh, has rotated by some angle in this direction. And the point here has moved up a bit. Okay, it was here before, then it's now here. Okay, and then after some time, the box has rotated some more, and uh, the, let's say, the point was here, then was here, and now is here. Okay, and the point has gone up a bit. So, very uh, simple movement. Of course, there is no force acting on this point, so, the, the 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 point is a linear a linear motion with co the the point is moving with linear motion with constant velocity. Okay, now we can draw the same thing with respect to the rotating reference system. So I ass now I, I assume that I am on the box that is moving. So I see the box as fixed, as immovable. I'm plotting the same thing. So this is the box. Now here the box is fixed now. And this is fixed. What is the apparent motion of the object? Now, it was here, it was here, now it is here, and then it is here. So, it appears as it is doing some movement in this way. Okay? Which means it seems that there is a force that is pushing the object in this direction. Actually, if, if we draw it uh, exactly, it seems that it is uh, uh, moving every time oops, that the force is acting in a direction which is orthogonal to the, uh, to the, um, to the instantaneous velocity. This uh, force is the Corelli force. So it is an apparent force that you only see if you're looking at the trajectory with respect to the rotating 
reference system and the acceleration due to the Coriolis force is 2 times V vector omega. So the acceleration is proportional to the vector product of the velocity times the uh, angular velocity, the vector corresponding to the angular velocity. So in this plane is going to be planar because the angular velocity is off plane and is also perpendicular to the initial velocity. So why this is interesting for us? Because we know how to measure an acceleration and now by exploiting this thing, if we know the velocity at some point because we put in motion the object and we know its velocity at any time, we can have an acceleration that is proportional to the angular velocity. So we are able to measure the angular velocity through the Coriolis acceleration. Okay, you, you, you see what, what you need to do. You, you need to put in motion an object with a velocity that is known. So, uh, how it is in practice implemented? You typically need to do this thing. You need to use two masses. This is one, mass one. And you need an identical mass two. Then let's assume that this is the case. The case is rotating with some angular velocity omega. And you want to measure omega. You want to measure the rot velocity rotation along the vertical axis. Okay? So this, this omega. You use two masses. One mass is also the plate, uh, the moving plate of a capacitor that has a fixed plate. Uh, this seems a ground, no, not a ground. This is, let's say, a fixed plate. Let's call it C1. You're, you have already understood the mechanism because it's exactly the same mechanism that we have used in the case of the acceleration. And then you use a copy of it. And then I will show you what is the copy for. The other thing that you need to do is to put these two masses in motion. And in order to put them in motion, what you do is uh, making them vibrate uh, in, this in this direction. So they vibrate in uh, synchronicity and in opposite direction. So at some point, you have this mass that is going in this direction and this mass that is going in this direction. After a few instants, you have the two masses going the two different directions. Of course, we use the vibration because it's not reasonable on, a, on solid state to have a motion that is, uh, let's say, continuous. Yeah, because that, I mean, you, you, don't, you, you, you can have only small movements. So if you want to have small movements with continuity, the only thing that you can do is a vibration. Okay? Now, let's focus on the mass on the left. This is V. Uh, you, you remember AC, the Coriolis force, is uh, uh, 2 times V vector omega. So V is in this direction, omega is out of the plane, and therefore the Coriolis force is in the vertical direction, upwards. So the acceleration is in this direction. For this uh, mass on the left, and then for the mass on the right, you have an acceleration in the other direction. And then you measure this acceleration, you see, is in the direction of, of the distance between, between the two plates uh, that form C1 and C2. So these two accelerations translate into a variation of capacitance C1 and C2. And therefore, you're able to measure the difference between the two capacitances, which is going to be proportional to omega. 
So to, to be more clear, the, as we have seen, the capacitance difference is going to be proportional to the acceleration, but V is known, is something that we know, so this is going to be proportional to omega, which is the quantity that we want to measure. So it is essentially the same principle of operation of the uh, accelerometer with the main difference, but there are two main differences. One difference is that we, we need to put in vibration the masses. In the case of the accelerometer, you don't put the masses in vibration. You no, don't need to. You don't need to do anything. The acceleration is given by the acceleration of the object on which the sensor is attached. Now, in this case, the acceleration is proportional to the velocity that you have to apply, and this velocity is something that uh, you induce on the masses by setting them in vibration, which means that you need the motor to put the mass in vibration. Okay? You need to do that. So it's a bit more complex. Then the other thing which is not uh, obvious, and, and I want to stress this point, is that you have two masses, not just one. And why is that? Why you have two masses and not just one? And th here the reason is, is simple. Because, of course, uh, since the principle of operation is the same as we have seen in the accelerometer, how do you distinguish be between a uh, an angular velocity and an acceleration. Let's assume that you have this object and you have a linear acceleration in the vertical direction, okay? If you have just one mass, what happens is that the, this acceleration causes a variation of uh, the capacitance, okay? Because uh, the, 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 you have a displacement of the mass and then you have an, a variation of capacitance. So what happens here is that if you have just one mass, you cannot really distinguish between a linear acceleration and a rotation. But you have two, if you have two masses, you can distinguish, because if you have a linear acceleration, the two capacitances, C1 and C2, vary in the same direction. While if you have a rotation, the, diff, uh, the, the, the two capacitances, C1 and C2, vary in opposite direction. So, if you use two masses, C1 minus C2 is zero if you have a linear acceleration and is uh, uh, different from zero only if you have a rotation. So, in this case, if there is a linear acceleration, for example, an acceleration of, of, of the car on which this accelerometer is put, linear acceleration, the two capacitances vary exactly in the same way, and therefore C1 and C2 vary in the same direction, and therefore C1 minus C2 is equal to zero. So we need the two masses in order to, let's say, be insensitive to the linear acceleration and to be sensitive only to a rotation. So the critical differences with respect to accelerometer are First, you need to put the masses in vibration with a motor. And second, you need to, let's say, use masses that are, uh, that are sensitive to a rotation, but that are not sensitive to the linear acceleration. And, for example, the easiest way is to, to use a symmetric uh, structure so that the masses... Uh, behave in the same way in the case of linear acceleration and therefore the difference of the effect is zero and behave in opposite way in the case of rotation and so the difference is uh, maximized. Okay?
just I want you to show uh, a movie. Also, in this case, of course, now you have uh, on on any uh, on any uh, let's say smartphone uh, uh, on mobile. Also, on mobile uh, uh, computers, you have uh, uh, also gyroscopes. Uh, uh, but historically, the main market uh, on which you needed to use uh, uh, high volumes of MEMS gyroscopes was the car market okay, for uh, stabilizers of the car. That was the main market for MEMS accelerometer. Of course, the main initial market of gyroscope wa uh, was the, 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 the planes and space, but that these are extremely small. But then when uh, we had a technology to fabricate gyroscopes at a reasonable cost, then the first market was uh, uh, the market of, uh, um, of, of cars. Uh, I just want to show you this video.